um, because I'm going to talk about the emergence of the very idea of, a, um, of an absolute standard. Um, and in my talk, I'm, I'm a professional philosopher, so I'm going to begin with some distinctions. By, by universal standard, it's, it's not, I mean uh, something that's universally accepted, like, like metrics, as you say. Natural standard uh, is, is something that's tied to natural phenomena, like the, the meridian of the Earth or a second pendulum. And an absolute standard is I mean, one that's, that's tied to a, um, a physical concept. Because they, these ideas uh, in, they are historical products. We didn't uh, we didn't avoid to have them. So I'm going to talk about the, uh, the origin of the idea of a of an absolute standard. Uh, we began in the 17th century, uh, and it's and we will hear from other than the session. Um, so let me begin by, by saying that once upon a time, every community on Earth had a different um, had its own measurement system that arose from local practices. And, and resources to serve local needs. So uh, that meant more important a community viewed a certain aspect of the environment, like gold dust in West Africa, or salt in Mesoamerica, or uh, distance in nomadic tribes, the finer and more elaborate the measures tended to uh, tended to be, and the more of these measures were specified and, and regulated. And let me just show you one example of, of how very ancient metrological systems were. Um, ancient China seems to have had the first elaborately organized system of weights and measures. The, um, here's a, uh, a foot measure of qi, which uh, from the uh, Zhou era, probably uh, several hundred, probably almost a thousand years BC. Um, but the, um, in, in the imperial rituals, the uh, pitch at court was tied to the length measure by the length of the, um, the, the standard uh, pitch regulator. Uh, so that the length measure was tied to the pitch, it changed the length measure. It also meant the change of the uh, pitch at court. And I made this episode in 374 AD, according to the shoe. I'm close uh, because I just hit the noise. The court was told it was just changed the length measure, and uh, he was. Uh, that, that created a, uh, that's a, um, that these were, um, uh, that this connection had to do with court legitimacy, that is, that the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the previous dynasty, he said, did not use the proper length measures, and this had to be corrected. And this is a little hard for, for us to imagine. It would be like a politician seeking power in the United States by saying that the U.S. should return to the foot inch and uh, pound measures of the founding fathers in Philadelphia in the late 1700s. Now the change uh, in 374 AD was, was only a millimeter or so, but it ran afoul of political politics. Shun Shu was accused of banned uh, scholarship and, and banned aesthetics. The blues played too high and he was forced out of power. Now books have been written about this episode, including one 400 million book just about this episode that came out last year. But it's a fascinating episode in how metrology can be tied to um, it can be tied to uh, politics and uh, social life. It's a rather extreme example. Um, there are but but metrological issues can often be entwined with social life. The uh, the connection happened in Europe as well. The Polish economic historian uh, Witold Kula in his book Measures and Men uh, goes so far as to say that unless you understand uh, how measures were used in pre-modern Europe, how they were used and abused, you can't understand pre-modern European life. So to understand the history of pre-modern Europe, he said you have to be a little bit of a metrologist. Then, within, and this is what my talk is about, within a staggeringly short period of time, historically speaking, just a few hundred years, all, virtually all these measurement systems became consolidated into one. Um, in, sorry, into two, the metric system and the imperial system, um, adopted by virtually every country on the planet. The, um, the roots of this transformation were a, uh, a, co a confluence of factors, technological, political, social, and scientific, that began to take place during the 17th century and continued in the 18th. Technologically, European uh, industrial workshops were becoming increasingly dependent on machines. These machines had parts, the parts uh, uh, often broke. You had to replace them with parts made the same precision as the old. And with the development of interchangeable uh, machines with interchangeable parts in the 18th century, uh, clocks and muskets and so forth, uh, this brought the, the demand for precision to, to a new level. So the, the uh, importance of a measuring network began to take precedence over, uh, over specific rulers or measuring devices. The Adam Smith's famous pin factory, which uh, he describes in The Wealth of Nations, 
uh, in which the division of labor makes it possible to produce thousands of pins, of uh, pins, thousands of uh, thousands um, of pins more than before, uh, rely on these standardized practices. Um, so the metrological developments were not just uh, technological, but allied with the new economic and political milieu of, of early capitalism. Political changes also affected the administration of weights and measures. The, uh, in the Middle Ages, local matters and, and fiefdoms could get away with having their own measures uh, and ignoring central government, which was relatively small, but, but as central governments became uh, stronger and stronger uh, and became developed more and more of an interest in controlling trade and international trade, the, um, the, uh, the, the incentive for governments to insist on and to uh, control standardized measures uh, increased. Socially, the idea of a national identity was increasingly defined with the notion of weights and measures. Uh, Kula said that the declaration of the rights of man, the evolution of the feudal system, a market economy, and measurement reform all went together. <coughs> Scientifically, too, the, the um, nature was uh, coming to be described not just by general rules of behavior, but by laws produced not by generalizations, but measurements. So by the time of the Indigenous Principia, the earlier idea of local places had been superseded by a concept of, of uh, space as single and uniform. So a lot, John Locke in the 17th century spelled out the implications of this for measurement. It, uh, standards could not, but uh, should not come from local practices and, uh, and local workshops, but, but uh, could be abstract and determined by abstract ideas. And with the, just around the time that he says this, in 1692, uh, ideas for, um, for tying standards to unchanging things became <coughs> much more attractive. Um, by the end of the 17th century, the French Academy and the British Royal Academy had come up with a few proposals for, for um, a natural light standard um, and assumed that a natural mass standard could be produced by, um, uh, by taking the amount of water filling a cubic, a cubic unit made from that plant standard. One proposal was to use a second pendulum, which is a pendulum that took a second to swing in, in a, uh, once in either direction. Galileo had discovered that the, the time is independent um, of fact, all other factors except for length, um, meaning, so, meaning that the length of a carefully built second pendulum, undisturbed by other influences, could be used to, uh, would be the same anywhere on Earth. As it is, a second pendulum is about a meter long, um, which makes it a convenient unit for a length standard. Um, you had to fix, of course, the latitude and the, um, uh, the height above sea level and the temperature. And the earliest proposals fixed this at 45 degrees, which is convenient for Europe. It wasn't so convenient for the United States, but Jefferson um, said that he would go along with that. Because 45 degrees is very far north, which is inconvenient for US scientists, but he's willing to go along out in the spirit of of internationalism. Another proposal was to use some fraction of the Earth's meridian. Um, the meridian circle around the equator was occasionally mentioned, but this, uh, it would be more difficult to measure than a meridian. And the answer only certain countries, where every country has a meridian testing to it. Uh, other ingenious ideas proposed were to use the, um, the distance that bodies fell in a second as a length standard, uh, or a drop of water, or wine, or oil um, at a particular temperature, uh, which could be used for several standards. You know, assuming drops were of equal size, the, the drops could fix standard weights and volumes, and even length of the cubic vessel was constructed. So that would kill three birds with one stone. So when the, metric, uh, when the metric system was created in France at the end of the 18th century, um, the meter was tied to the meridian. It was to be one ten millionth of the quadrant of the meridian passing through Paris. In 1824, Great Britain enacted its own Weights and Measures Act, which was effectively its response to the metric system, uh, formally establishing the imperial system based on units that had been inherited from the Romans and used throughout the British Empire for, for centuries. Its most revolutionary feature was to tie the light standard, the yard, to a natural phenomenon, the second pendulum. So, Therefore, but by the early 19th century then, both of these, both advanced industrial nations, France and Great Britain, had attempted to tie their weights and measures systems to natural standards. Um, let me just, uh, it, 
mention one bizarre uh, parenthesis here and mention another possibility, which is to do metrology by divine revelation. Um, this is a little later, but it can be um, just shortly after the Treaty of the Meter, the United States Congress uh, passed a um, call for comments about a bill to convert the metric system. Uh, the measure met with opposition from engineers, but also by uh, uh, an anti-metric movement, and anti-metric movements, as we know, in the United States tend to be um, very, uh, tend to have um, colorful, eccentric people um, <laughs> who trace their cause back to divine commandments and have wacky props. Uh, and this one was no exception. The wacky prop of the anti-metric movement in the 1880s was the Great Pyramid of Egypt, um, which was surely the most bizarre example of, of a, an object seriously proposed as a metrological standard. Um, but it's stable, it's been around for a long time, which is the kind of thing that you want in a uh, standard. Some scientists, including the astronomer royal of Scotland, Charles Piazza Smith, um, thought that the um, the pyramid had been built by slave labor. This architect had been a Hebrew who had taken instruction from God himself. After all, he's the great part of God, he's the great architect, um, and, and used the pyramid to show humanity the right measures for uh, to use light, volume, and temperature. Um, Piazza Smith even proposed that the great pyramid be turned into an international meteorological park. Now, the idea was a little wacky, you know, the God had used the fundamental, um, had, had seen that, that um, the fundamental unit was incorporated by Hebrew architects into an Egyptian pyramid in order that the English people could incorporate it into the imperial system. Uh, but these kind of wacky ideas uh, excite people. And uh, the prop was made to order, right? It was the, the, um, its symbol was on every American dollar bill. Now, there are many arguments why we might not want to use divine revelation to, to fix measurement units. Um, some of the arguments are human that you know what kind of evidence we have to have in order to prove that the that the evidence uh, that by thinking someone would do something would finally reveal. But my favorite argument is by uh, the uh, philosopher Charles Peirce about whom I'll speak more in a minute. Um, who said that, you know, after all, we know so little about the divine mind that it isn't conceivable that he's trying to trick us in order to, uh, to, to um, have us rely on our own resources. Now, getting back to natural standards, by the middle of the 19th century, serious doubts had, had been raised about them. In the metric system, uh, the French found errors in Michelin de Long's work for measuring meridian. Uh, and error, other errors in calculating, calculating the meridian. This meant that the meter of the archives um, was a few lines, about uh, 0.2 millimeters, shorter than the, def the official definition of, of uh, the fraction of meridian. Not only that, the kilogram of the archives was a little lighter than the cubic decimeter water. Um, so, uh, uh, and more rethinking followed during a scientific gathering in Paris in 1827. Some scientists pointed out that if a comet or asteroid hit the Earth and altered its shape and axis of rotation, this would change both the meridian measurements and the second kind of um, and what would happen then? <laughs> um, so Earth evidently was not as good at having a, a source for natural standards as assumed. And genius participants then raised the work to figure out the workable standards that would be independent of the Earth's measurement. Uh, Humphrey Davy proposed using capillary action for the basic length measure would be the diameter of the thin tube of glass which sucked up water uh, by the same amount as the diameter which he presumed to be independent of gravity. Jacques Fabinet suggested using light uh, wavelengths as the basic unit instead. Then, on October 16, 1834, disaster struck the imperial system. The houses of Parliament burned down and uh, taking with them the imperial standards. Now this was exactly the sort of disaster, right, that, the, that had made the idea of the natural standards so attractive. The, um, the standards should be able to be recovered as, as exactly as they were before, with no changes in size. Unfortunately, a scientific committee chaired by uh, George Airy discovered that this was impossible. The seconds pendulum wasn't accurate enough 
to recreate the uh, original light standard. Uh, by the way, George Gary is beloved of historians because he saved every single scrap of paper and the list of laundry list in there. So, so historians find him a wonderful source of, of information. Um, so the, the seconds, this was a, a disaster because the seconds kind of looked and fired the imaginations of those who believed in natural standards and universal systems for a century and a half. So what should have been a triumph for metrology was a, uh, instead a, um, an embarrassment. So th this shook the confidence of many British scientists in the idea of natural standards. Many standards had to were intended to be arbitrary, and the only criteria should be utility. Uh, meanwhile, metrology uh, advanced swiftly with the second phase of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, electrical measurements were a vanguard. Beginning in the 1840s, the expanding telegraph industry pushed the development of, of electrical standards in Great Britain. Um, other um, the clamors for precision in other areas were not far behind. The 1851 uh, exhibition at the Crystal Palace, which is the first large international exhibition of, um, of industrial machinery, was a showcase, uh, and it it was a, it drove it was a stimulus for greater international cooperation using measurement standards um, and units. Another factor was uh, was geodesy. This principal activity was, was the precision measurement of gravitational variations, which, which um, provided information about the shape of the Earth. Um, now, so many of you, I think, will be familiar with Albert Michelson's remark um, to the effect that our future discoveries must be looked for in six places in decimals. Um, that's often viewed as um, a naive lament that the age of great discoveries is over, but the situation is more complex. It was Michelson was more optimistic than that. In the next sentence, he said that uh, it follows that every means which facilitates accuracy and measurement um, is a possible factor in future discovery. Um, so when physicists in the late 19th century articulated their goal as a search for increasing precision, it wasn't a, um, a slackening of pace. If anything, the pace was, was increasing. The, uh, the search for greater precision and greater practical urgency. National was in a national interest, had theoretical significance, and it even had moral value in the Victorian age. Um, this was, after all, the age of the establishment of the great uh, metrological laboratories, the uh, uh, NPL, uh, the right constable, and the uh, National Bureau of Standards. Um, and actually, given the, the discovery of the quantum in, in precision measurements at the right constel, and in the discovery of relativity in deviations of starlight, this, the 19th century expectation that the future discovery would take place in, in decimal places would, was in fact fulfilled. Now, aligned with this, this increase in the um, request for precision was a revival of the dream to find an, act, an absolute light standard. Um, the, and, and one of the drivers here was the stunning success of uh, Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, about which we heard on Monday, which convinced many scientists that the meter possibly could be tied to the wavelength of a spectral line. Uh, Maxwell himself was a promoter of this hope in the, in the treatise, uh, thinking that the meter might be tied to a sodium line. Uh, but the first person to experimentally tie the um, meter to a wavelength of light was Charles, the person I mentioned a few moments ago, Charles Peirce. Uh, he was, Peirce was, Peirce's father was an astronomer at Harvard, Benjamin Peirce, who, who raised his son, who um, gave his son two, two a series of uh, uh, two apprenticeships. One was uh, at the Coast Survey, uh, the other was at the uh, Harvard Observatory. The survey, he learned, um, did, uh, he learned about precision length measurements at the um, observatory. He learned about spectroscopy, which was in his infancy. Um, and, and these prepared him for a measurement time meter to wavelengths of, of light. Um, one of the person's duties in the survey was to head the Office of Weights and Measures, which was then housed in the uh, Washington Bureau of the um, the sur uh, of the survey, uh, which brought well, first into the growing metrological community. Um, in 1875, the first went to Europe to pick up instruments. Uh, to, to pick up some instruments. Um, 
he met with several people on that trip, including Maxwell, and given what happened next, uh, it's very likely that he talked to Maxwell about the, uh, the idea of using the sodium line to connect with the meter. Um, on the way back, he made, in, after returning in 1876, uh, he began what would be the first, the, the first measurement to tie a unit meter to, to the wavelength of light. The principle was, was simple, um, relying on the, the relation between spacing and angular deviation and wavelength. Um, it wasn't without problems. I mean, remember, this was 1876 to 1879. This was, bef this was before the Michelson-Morley experiment. So uh, he was afraid that there'd be possible ether effects that may cause to changes in um, variations in wavelength. Um, but still, he worked on the idea for several years. And uh, success depended on the grading. Um, these were by then, uh, the diffraction grading, these were by then indispensable instruments, which had replaced prisms with precision uh, devices and spectroscopy and, and, and optics. Um, in, uh, Davis, by the way, was science dean uh, at, uh, at MIT. Um, in the 1870s, the the foremost ruler of ratings uh, was Lewis Rutherford, who was a uh, character himself. He was an amateur astronomer, independently wealthy, and uh, he built an observatory at his home in New York City on 11th Street and 2nd Avenue. And when he heard about the, um, the um, Bunsen Kirchhoff's um, discovery in 1859 that spectra were, were composed of fingerprints and chemical atoms, um, chemical elements. He became interested in spectroscopy and built a ruling machine. Ruling machines were very difficult uh, before to build before uh, the electric motors. And he, he built this one to run off the New York City water system in which an automatic machine that used a diamond stylus and a, 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 a micrometer screw. Um, the gratings that were produced were amazing devices. Many are now at the, the Smithsonian. They were about, this is about a, an inch and a, a half square. They were, each one was signed and dated and took a month or so to produce. Um, and the information was, was uh, about the lines per inch were, um, were written on, on all of them. Um, he gave away these gratings that were very difficult to produce for free, which made very popular among astronomers. And when Peirce came calling, um, Brother Peirce engine had a wheel with 360 teeth on its circumference, and it ruled uh, 6,800 lines per centimeter. Um, Peirce then um, was able to uh, uh, Use these this uh, diffraction grating to connect the um, the meter with um, with wavelength uh, uh, with the wavelength of light um, and published a brief progress report <coughs> note on the progress of experiments for comparing wavelength with the meter in July 1859 issue of American Journal of Science. Um, he kept improving these measurements. Uh, the problem with first though is he, he was he, he must today it would be. Um, he would be diagnosed as having ADD. He could never finish a project once he began it uh, and, and published very little in his lifetime. So there's very little about this. About this. this is one, this is the basic publication. Um, as soon as he published it though, people, people immediately looked up and realized his promise for them was Albert Michelson, uh, who just then was in the middle of this experiment with Morley uh, at Case on um, uh, studying ether drift. And they realized that their instrument that they were using for ether drift could, uh, be, could do the same thing that uh, Peirce was doing, only much better. And in June 1887, uh, Michelson and Morley then conducted preliminary experiments. Uh, they described a paper also in the American Journal of Science. Um, and they, they showed their work dramatically illustrated the limitations of Peirce's approach but also its revolutionary potential. What they did was to, to um, attach, a, a, uh, they would count wavelengths um, here and uh, essentially use the wavelengths as a ruler to, to measure the, um, the micrometer spacings over here. So they, Peirce's work and Michelson's improvement 
reinvented the dream of an absolute standard. And after they published the result, William Harkness, who was president of the American Philosophical, of the Philosophical Society of Washington, expressed the dream as follows. Imagine a, um, suppose in the distant future, an interstellar traveler arrives at, at a distant planet far beyond the realm of, uh, of telescopes, and maybe even after the sun is burned, they favor to a crisp. Um, that traveler is then asked to reproduce the original standards that, uh, that he had on Earth. Up to now, Harkness said he couldn't possibly do it, um, but, uh, but what, um, but, but Hearst's work, followed by Michelson's work, now made it, uh, made it thinkable to, uh, that's Michelson's, uh, uh, now made this um, uh, thinkable. Um, Benjamin Gould, who was the American member of the BIPM, related the work of Michelson Morris um, experiment to the agency's director for inviting Michelson to work at the BIPM on the idea. Michelson arrived in 1992, and he measured the red line of cadmium to one part in 10 million. Now, it would turn out that tying the meter to a wavelength of light was harder than the thought. The vector lines were not equally sharp for several reasons, nor were they equally easy to make or to measure. And much more work would be required studying spectral lines and, um, and developing interferometers. Uh, and so the formal redefinition of the meter would not uh, take place um, until 1960. This, um, so, and, and this standard didn't, of course, mean that the, the development of absolute precision but the beginning of another kind of quest for it. Now, length was one thing, mass was another. Maxwell had proposed tying the kilogram to atoms, but scaling up mass turned out to be much more difficult than scaling up length. Also, uh, uh, Planck realized that his constant made it possible to define fundamental units of length, mass, and time. Um, but, and this was but one of several schemes at the time for, old, for what was called ultimate rational units. So this then sets the stage for the talks you're about to hear. The, the notion of, a, of, a, of an absolute uh, standard um, wasn't, um, was a historical product. It was, it, it was born in the, in the 17th century um, and had, um, um, what was, um, the dream was, was shattered in the early 19th century, but it was reborn um, by the end of the 19th century. So this then sets the stage for the other talks that we're about to hear. So thank you.